All right, guys, here we are. We're with Oz, uh, star of Rhino Wars. How you doing, Oz? Good, good. Good. We wanted to come to you and kind of give you a video on medical uh, treatment and, you know, stuff that you're going to use in a medical situation. Uh, I was talking to Oz about talking about eye facts and such, and uh, he was saying, hey, let's talk about the uh, the injuries first, you know, before before the treatment, kind of leading up to, you know, what we got to do first. So if you want to kind of talk about that, what you were thinking about when uh, we were texting earlier. Yeah, certainly. Um, I can definitely tell you, I've taken both civilian courses and um, military courses and law enforcement courses. Uh, and the one thing that everyone really focuses on initially is the safety aspect of everything. So that's something that I really want to encourage people to think about before they they start really developing their their medical skills or their tactical skills, is that everything falls back on safety. So um, with that, there's a lot of different injuries that you can see, um, not just overseas, but stateside. Um, a ballistic wound stateside is a ballistic wound overseas. So a gunshot wound in Afghanistan is a gunshot wound in Chicago. Um, it does the same thing to the body and causes the same amount of trauma. The treatment is really the same. So uh, a car accident here, a car accident there, it makes no difference. So the medicine is essentially the same. Uh, the treatment is the same. Uh, the desired outcome is the same. The difference is, is in the environment and the potential for harm and the potential for continued danger. So that's where... Combat medicine gets a little bit more extreme, which is really my kind of where I'm more focused. Um, but when it comes to like paramedicine, paramedicine uh, being paramedics stateside, um, that awareness for danger is still there. Um, you can imagine a paramedic responding to you know a stabbing uh, who, who maybe didn't know that it was a stabbing could put themselves in danger, or you know on the freeway uh, cars zipping by. So um, injuries are injuries, black and white. You've got your acute trauma, which is going to be, um, you know, that, that quick injury that um, is spontaneous. So it happens, um, you know, in, in an instant, like a blunt trauma from a baseball bat. That's acute. And then you've got your chronic ailments and ailments. Chronic ailments and ailments are things that we kind of knew about, like uh, COPD or, you know, a patient has asthma and has an asthma attack. Having asthma is a chronic condition. However, an asthma attack can be an acute condition. So there's kind of some of the terminology that you might uh, find when you start looking into some of the medicine stuff. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, an easy way to get yourself um, familiarized with some of the, uh, the, the explanations that you might find in, uh, in a program we're about to talk about. So for, for everyone who's watching, just uh, to give you a little bit of your background, being 18 Delta... You know, if you want to go through that, maybe just like a one-minute kind of synopsis of your background as far as talking sure. about the subject. Yeah, um, my background is uh, is all from the Army. I joined the Army when I was about 17 years old. Uh, started off as an infantryman, so carrying around a 240 machine gun, and then uh, decided that I wanted to do something a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more professional, um, professionally trained, I guess you could say. So uh, I went to the Green Berets, my specialty um one of the things that I do is trauma medicine. So um, we're called 18 Deltas. That's our military occupational um, identifier. So our MOS or our specialty. Uh, 18 Deltas go through a pretty rigorous pipeline. Um, we go through all the, the cool um, shoot them, jump out of planes, um, crazy stuff that all the special operations guys go through. But we have to do additional training for combat medicine. Uh, 18 Deltas. Basically, you learn a lot of trauma medicine because that's what we're supposed to see. Um, we're going to see gunshot wounds, explosions, amputations, uh, crazy stuff like that. But 18 Deltas, the nature of our work is a lot of times and often uh, in isolated areas where we have very little resources or no additional resources, long evacuation times, um, and we just don't have anybody else to help us. So our course is really designed to um, create kind of a one-stop shop. So we're trained in everything from dental medicine to veterinary medicine, uh, delivering babies, giving, uh, you know, horses, C-sections, all sorts of crazy stuff that we might come across. So I wouldn't say that we're uh, a master of any of those things, but fortunately the Joint Special Operations Medical Training Center in Fort Bragg does an amazing job to kind of expose us to the things that we might come across so that we're not totally in the dark. Um, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm a National Registry paramedic, and that's as far as my medical certifications go officially. 
um, but I have advanced surgical skills that I use in combat. So let's give everybody a little bit kind of a background of you know who you are if they haven't come across any of our videos before. Um, yeah. So, so as you were talking, you know, or before we started the video, um, so if someone were to come across, um, maybe I'm not sure what you want to talk about, you know, on on the streets, you know, a car accident or something, you know, you want to talk yeah. about yeah. Uh, injuries yeah, versus let's talk treatment. About what's realistic to the audience? Right. Um, so what will be realistic is, you know, you're sitting in your house, you hear tires screech, you go outside, and there's a kid lying on the ground, and obviously there's a car accident. So um, those kind of things are, are not um, unlikely. They happen every single day. Or you're sitting uh, in your house, and you hear someone scream, you run over, you see someone's cut their hand open with their skill saw. Um, so there's, there's a lot of injuries that you can definitely treat with very, very minimal knowledge. I think it's really important to acknowledge the fact that there are laws that, per, that definitely pertain to uh, someone who's trying to help someone in a medical emergency. So one of them is the Good Samaritan Law. And the Good Samaritan Law, just to paraphrase it, um, essentially says that if you're trying to help someone in distress, um, if the actions that you conduct in helping that person would be what any reasonable person would do during that time. If I see someone with their leg cut off, and I put a tourniquet on there, that might be above the skill set of an average person. However, if I take a flamethrower and try to cauterize the wound, that's just absurd, right. and right. That, that's crazy. So I wouldn't be protected in that. So the Good Samaritan Law protects mostly people that are not medically trained. Uh, it's kind of a catch-22. I don't really understand how it kind of came out that way, but essentially, if I, as a paramedic, who right now I don't have a medical director, and as an 18 Delta... Um, with a battalion surgeon that hasn't authorized me to practice medicine in the States, if I come across a car accident and someone's airway is destroyed and i got to do a crike, which is a surgical procedure to open up the airway, whether I do it correctly or I mess things up and make things worse, uh, I could be um, sued for practicing medicine without a license because mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing. I'm doing medicine. I'm not just – a lay person wouldn't know to do that procedure. I've been trained, but I've also been told that I can't do these things without a medical oversight. So – those are some things you should know about. Another really important fact is that if you look at any true medical device, like a tourniquet, which is a tourniquet, which is a definite medical device, it says somewhere on there to be used by a medical professional only. Um, again, another funny twist in the law, if I apply a tourniquet um, and I'm not a medical provider, I can be sued for using a medical device without a license. However, if I create a tourniquet because I know how to create one, I get a cravat and some sticks and I tie it on there and I make a tourniquet, it's not a medical device, so I can't be sued. It's really kind of weird, but it's really important to know the laws in your area before you start filling the back of your truck with surgical equipment and driving around looking for accidents. Right, right. Now, would that actually fall within that um, reasonable, if you were actually to create that? Would that kind of be kind of blurry as far as going advanced? Um, you have more protection with that blurriness um, because the Boy Scouts, hey, they know how to do this stuff. Right. Um, Looking at stuff like this on TV, it's open source. So there's a lot more information than there was 15 years ago about this kind of stuff. But um, right there on the tourniquet, on the medical device, it says, tells you right there not to be used by anyone other than medical professionals. So you know what, dude? In my opinion, you save someone's life. They want to screw you over for it? By all means, dude. Uh, that's fine. I'm going to sleep at night knowing that I did everything I could to save you. Exactly. Uh, there's no law that says you have to help people. I right. Mean, that whole... Jerry Seinfeld thing, uh, it's, 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 there's like a gray area with that. You, you're not entitled to help someone, especially if you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel that you could do so safely. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you know, you, you, you're protected whether you do or don't. Right, right, exactly. So, so let's move on to, to uh, the tactical side of things to kind of talk about you know, IFACs and, and medical goods you might see on people's kit um, sure. running around, you know, uh, hitting the range. I'm a huge proponent of if you're hitting the range, you better have a medical kit with you. Yeah, um, I agree. I definitely see some people who you know don't have that, so it's definitely a concern. So if someone's going to hit, let's just take that for an example, something they might come across at the range. Um, you know, what do you recommend at a minimum someone carries on them or uh, in their their range bag or whatever? Um, I, I basically, from my training and and my background, I have a systematic way of solving problems. Um, and what I essentially do is I try to identify the mission, and then I identify. I kind of go backwards. I go, how do I accomplish that mission? What are going to be the most 
dangerous things that I might encounter, what's the most likely thing I might encounter. So those are all um, things that we as soldiers, we, we learn to plan for. So when you're talking about how to prepare your medical kit for whatever it is you're gonna do, there's a couple of factors that you really need to, talk, you need to consider. One of them is, again, your mission. What are you gonna be doing? If you're gonna be hiking in you know, the mountains, um, ballistic wounding is, is unlikely uh, unless a hunter shoots you, but more than likely you're going to have exposure to the elements. You're going to have hypothermia. You're going to have uh, twisting of your ankle. You're going to have potentially broken bones. Um, so a little bit of a different medical bag. Um, whereas if you go to the range, you're not likely to have those things happen. Rather, uh, the potential for ballistic injury now is, is, is there. So the mission is really, really important. The next thing to consider is your skill set. What can you handle? It makes no sense for you to go grab, you know, a massive bag with surgical scalpels and all this high-speed stuff, airway stuff, uh, when it's beyond your skill set. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense financially, and it doesn't make any sense in common sense regards. So you don't want to, um, you don't want to pick too much. You know, I've got a bag and I can pick it up. This bag is an M9 bag, but it's it's got so much stuff in it um, that it's great. But you know what? If I was in a pinch and I needed to find something in that bag, I couldn't do it. So I have two different bags. When, I, when I'm on my missions, I have a, a go bag that I take with me, and I have a bag that I leave in the truck that's got a lot more stuff. So you want something that's gonna be light, it's gonna be mobile, probably, um, and then it has to cater to your needs and your skill set. So uh, this little um, interview that we're doing essentially is gonna cater to people that have a, um, a basic skill set or a, a neg no skill set. So it's going to address acute injuries um, and the most preventable causes of death, which is hemorrhage, which is bleeding out, and then airway problems. And those two things, if you can, if you can fix someone that's been injured, stop them from bleeding, and keep the airway open, you just bought them an right. opportunity to survive virtually anything. Right. So those are the things we're going to talk about. So um, you hit upon IFACs. IFACs come in a variety of different shapes and, and colors and Configurements. This is a relatively small one. I mean, you see, it's yeah. I was gonna say it's pretty hands. small. I got big hands, but you, know, <laughs> you, you get the picture. I mean, you could put this in a cargo pocket, okay? Um, and let's take a look and see what's inside this IFAC. So this IFAC is uh, it's called the BTK. It's a belt trauma kit, and essentially it has some combat gauze right here, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It has a SWAT T tourniquet, which if you're not familiar with, you should take a look at it online. It's it's kind of cool. Um, it has its pros and cons. Right now, the committee that certifies my schooling, uh, it's called the Tactical Combat Casualty Care Committee, um, endorses or really authorizes us to carry two tourniquets. It's the CAT tourniquet, uh, which is the combat um, application tourniquet, which is an old tourniquet that came out years ago but has proven itself in battle. The other one is a soft T wide. Uh, the soft T wide is the newer one. It's a uh, stronger uh, and I think it's a better tourniquet, but there's a lot of them out there. Um, essentially, the best tool for the best job is the one that you can use effectively and then replicate under stress m the most consistently. So that's that's my take on tourniquets. But this is a very small kit. There's not a lot in it. There's some gauze, a tourniquet, and, and that's pretty much it. But you see, it's very slim and easy to carry. Um, this is the this is actually the kit that I carried on the show Battleground Rhino Wars. Um, this one's a little bit more in depth, but again, we had um, resources that allowed us to rapidly transport to places for additional medical help, so I didn't need a lot. Right. What I had was a needle for decompression, which is a surgical procedure, so we're not going to get too far into that. But I have one really awesome tool called the NPA, which is a nasopharyngeal airway, and essentially all it is is a, is a plastic tube. Okay. It's not rigid. It's uh, semi-rigid, but what it is... Is designed to be inserted into the nasal airway and to provide someone with um, protection from their tongue from falling back and occluding the airway. Um, so a little bit of, of anatomy, the tongue is attached to your mandible, your lower jaw. So you can't swallow your tongue, like I explained to so many people that think you can. You cannot swallow your tongue. But what happens is when your body is in a, an unconscious level, unresponsive level, uh, state, you have no control over anything. That's, that's, a, that's a time where it's not sleep. So don't confuse being unconscious with 
um, you know, and unresponsive with being asleep. Okay. If you're asleep and I stick a needle in your arm, you're going to jump. You're going to move. You're going to respond to it. If you're unconscious, unresponsive, I could cut you with a scalpel and you wouldn't move. You'd have no response. I could essentially conduct a surgical procedure on you and you were not aware of it. So it's a completely different state of mind. A person who's unconscious, unresponsive, essentially you can conclude that they cannot control their airway, meaning that they can't protect their airway. So if I took and knocked somebody out and threw them in a pool of water, they're going to drown. They're going to make no attempt right. to, to provide oxygen to themselves. And so that being said, the tongue relaxes and it falls back and it closes the narrow airway uh, of your trachea. So that's what that MPA is designed to do is it goes in through your nose and it prevents that from happening. So, um, the rule of thumb for the NPA is that it needs to be measured. So it should measure from the corner of your ear to the corner of your nose. Um, obviously, you want to measure this on the person you're applying it to. Um, it typically goes into the right nostril um, because of the way it's cut, but it can be inserted into either nice nostril. Uh, lubrication is a, is a definite plus because you're going to have friction in the nostril. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that the NPA actually goes up the nasal passage, the nasal passage actually goes straight into your face. So a good rule of thumb is to push your your patient, their nose up, and insert the, in, the NPA straight back into their face. Um, you might find some resistance, that's where the lubrication helps, you do a little bit of twisting and, and you get it in. If you can't get it in that side, try the other side. Yeah. Um, another key to any intervention that you do is to reassess your patient. So if, if I was injured and Cap, you came over and you assessed me and you realized that I'm breathing uh, at, a, at a very shallow rate and you hear some noises from my upper airway, you go, hey, you know what? I don't know if this airway is secure, but I remember Oz saying anybody who can't respond to me uh, needs to have an MPA in. You put that MPA in and now you need to reassess. And now you look to see if there was a change. Um, it's kind of like shooting. I mean, you don't just shoot in the dark. <laughs> Right. You know, you, you, you try to look for an effect. You fire for effects. So, you know, when we train for shooting, we don't just shoot one round and holster. We shoot, we reassess, we look to see that we got the desired effect on the target. If we didn't, we continue to shoot. And then we, we holster. So medicine is the same way. I, I find an amputated leg, I put a tourniquet on it. I have to see that that tourniquet did something to it, right. uh, to that bleeding. And then I, I decide if I need to do something additional or, or not. So, um... An MPA is a great tool. It's a it's a very cheap tool. Um, it's measured um, in a system called French, and the most common size to have is a 28 French. Um, another really important thing about the NPA is it's better to have a longer one than a shorter one. Um, maybe that applies to more things than just an MPA, but right now we're talking about this. So um, <laughs> the reason for that is because if the NPA is too short. It's not going to reach to where the tongue causes that occlusion, which is around here. Um, it's going to be short, and the tongue is going to fall back, and it's going to cause that occlusion anyway. So now you've got an MPA in someone, and you're thinking that maybe they're safer than they really are. You move that person and inadvertently, you close their airway, and they suffocate. People don't make a lot of noise when they suffocate. So um, you got to monitor people with airway problems very, very closely. If the airway tool is too long, what might happen is you might trigger a gag reflex. Um, okay, so you triggered a gag reflex, pull the NPA back out just a little bit. So it still does the job. So it's a, it's a really handy tool to have. Requires really no training. Um, it's super cheap. It's a plug and go kind of thing. And um, you, won't, you won't cry about it when it disappears with your patient. Yeah, they're about like, I think, $5 and you know, like yeah, it, tactical uh, medical solutions. Definitely. Yeah, tac med solutions I definitely like. And they usually come yeah. with the jelly anyhow.